Well, well, I'd love I'd love to jump this off with with going like straight at it of like what is trauma and what not is trauma because it's as much what not is trauma because like when we were growing up the word trauma wasn't really a very commonly used word whereas nowadays it's very common it's a very commonly used word and I think certainly myself before today and yesterday doing lots of research on it I really didn't understand what was trauma and what wasn't trauma and the the very basics of it yeah I'm not sure if anybody does. Um, you know, trauma is something that happens. Trauma that is as PTSD is something that happens where we're really overwhelmed beyond our capacity to respond to adapt and that we are caught in overwhelming helplessness. Uh, uh, one of the best definitions actually was by Sigmund Freud when he said that trauma is a breach in the protective barrier against stimulation leading to feelings of overwhelming helplessness. And I would only add that trauma is a breach in the protective barrier against over stimulation leading to feelings of, of overwhelming helplessness. When I first made my discoveries of what trauma was, was way before the definition of trauma as PTSD. And, uh, and I was actually working with a group of men who had uh, were suffering from high blood pressure. And I found that working with certain muscles in their bodies, particularly the jaw, the neck, and the shoulders, uh, would, uh, would often uh, bring the blood pressure down by 10, 20, 30, even occasionally by 40 uh, uh, amount. And, but at the same time, certain images and memories came up when I worked with these people. So uh, let me just say one thing first about what trauma is or isn't. Trauma is, uh, it, it's not so much what happens to us, what happened to us, but rather what we hold inside in the absence of that present empathetic other who was there for us. And, and uh, that makes all the difference in the world. When I'm completing my autobiography, one of the things that, even though I was exposed to extreme violence and cruelty at a certain time in my life, what was in some ways even more difficult is that nothing was ever spoken about it and no reassurance was given. So uh, also trauma, when it was defined as PTSD, was more or less uh, something that was like a brain disorder, maybe even a brain disease, in quotes. And it was something that could only be best managed with medications and with, uh, with helping people change negative thoughts. But I was discovering something quite, quite different. And rather that trauma is really uh, something that happens in the body. So, for example, you just go outside in your, you know, in your office or your room, and you look, and somebody's been hit by a car, and you go, ah, and that's a twisting in the gut. And um, Charles Darwin, amazingly, realized that the vagus nerve was responsible for meeting the for mediating these kind of uh, responses, these kind of reactions. And he he wrote that trauma is about, or over, overactive in, uh, act, overactivity and shutdown of the nervous system was mediated by the vagus nerve, and led, which led to gut wrench and heartbreak. And so these are things that go inside of our bodies. It's not something we have any vol voluntary control over, it's something that just really, uh, just uh, uh, brings us to to a place where we're not able to rebound. We're not able to to respond. So, so really, hey, Peter, it really sounds like that trauma is it's a, it's lonely. You're isolated. You're on your own. As you said, it's the lack of present, and that's kind of the compounding factor. That without this, that if there was presence. That would be the support that would help you release this trauma. But without the present, the, the, the trauma almost, it's pointed inwards and it expands. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, it's what takes place in isolation. And also what's known now, uh, I think it's pretty clear from a l- number of different research studies, that what really predisposes us for becoming traumatized is, um, is what happens in our earliest times uh, postnatally or, or uh, perinatally, uh, that uh, we, when we are unable to fight, to, to make bonds, to bond, to make an attachment with our caregivers, that really makes us more susceptible to becoming traumatized at a later time. So those are such important factors and that they can easily be overlooked. So, so trauma is not just, as I said, not just what happens to us, but also, uh, also what, which is pre- we are predisposed for trauma when we are unable to have that bond forming with our with our loving, caring other, with our with our parents, our caregivers. And and on, on that one, I was wondering, like we were discussing here uh, before we started, and we were kind of going like, is there? Is, is more trauma attributed to early childhood and being a baby than as adults? Like, you know, is there, if you were to give a weighting of it, would be the more than 50% to do with childhood and being a baby and, as you said, prenatally rather than in adulthood? Yeah. You know, when I first started to, um, to uh, work with people, it became really clear that, well, there are two things. Uh, at first, I I was noticing that uh, trauma is occurs in two forms. One is shock trauma, like when you went out the door and you saw somebody injured, you respond immediately. Our brain responds to injury and then affects our body. And uh, or if we're in an automobile accident and we haven't had a lot of early trauma. Those are what are sometimes, I, or at least I call, shock trauma. Boom, something comes out of the blue and you're, and you're overwhelmed, but you still had a secure base from our, from our ch- early childhood. And, uh, and those traumas are really easy to work with. Usually it takes one or two sessions. Now, when there's been a lot of early uh, attachment ruptures, ruptures in the relationship, then it's much, uh, it takes more time to work with, and we have to work both with the shock traumas that may have occurred later, but also with the lack of that holding environment. And that's that lack of holding environment, again, that makes us so much more susceptible to the trauma and the ongoing eroding effects of, of stress that just is unabating and then just continues through, uh, particularly from through our early childhood. So those are the kinds of uh, issues that really determine how we'll rebound. I say the good news though, is even though we may have had a lot of early trauma, even though that was, may have been the case, we still, um, we still can rebound. We can become more resilient. You know, one of the things that uh, when I was beginning to study the human condition, uh, I, I, in 1975, I think, I had the opportunity to work with NASA, the, the, the organization that's responsible for... Uh, uh, space travel. Yeah, for space travel. And uh, there was a, 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 a phenomenon called zero gravity uh, sickness. So when the rocket ships would blast off, of course, it was a high, high amount of arousal. And when they went into orbit, into zero G orbit or low G orbit, uh, some, of the, um, some of the astronauts would uh, throw up. And this was not just messy, and, uh, but it could, of course, it could abort the whole mission. It could have caused a catastrophic breakdown of the electronics. And so they really wanted to know uh, how, uh, if it would be predictable, which astronauts would, would do that. But most of the astronauts that I noticed were quite resilient. And, uh, and I was wondering what is it that I can learn from their resilience 
that can be applied to uh, uh, fostering more resilience in some of the people that I was working with. The other thing that was important in, in my exploration was understanding animal, uh, animal behavior in their natural environments, wild animals in their natural environments. And uh, because animals, many animals, most prey animals may be predated upon, predated upon many times in a single day, yet they routinely don't develop the kind of trauma that, that humans do. And they could if they were in a place, for example, where they were trapped. But if not, they, they rebound. So what is it about the animal experience? What is it about the astronauts that we can learn, that I can learn in working with my, uh, with my individuals, with my, with my clients? So that kind of gave me the beginning, the foothold in the development of my work, which eventually became known as somatic experiencing some of the body, but not just the anatomical body, the living body, that uh, that that the living body uh, is the experience of the living body really provides us with the resilience that we need to overcome trauma and even ongoing continuing stress in our early childhood. Yeah, so like when you mentioned about the wild animal that typically is prey, often when it's caught and it say it manages to escape, the way it deals with it, it shakes and it might shake for 20 minutes or whatever a period of time. And afterwards, it kind of norms to homeostasis. It norms to where it's feeling safe, it's feeling secure and it's sitting lying in the sun and it all is well. <clears throat> Whereas humans, is it as simple as that for humans, given that we're mammals, that we get caught by something, some life-threatening incident? For example, we nearly get hit by a car, someone saves our life. And if we were to sit in the curb and shake for 20 minutes, would it be as simple as that as a means of eradicating this trauma? Or is that overly yeah. simplistic? No, if, well, I mean, yes and no. Um, you know, the, the kind of shaking, often a gentle shaking that may go on for minutes or longer is really important in resetting our autonomic nervous system, the autonomic, the automatic part of our nervous system. And that's extremely important, but it's not by itself the necessary, a necessary condition. I'm thinking uh, in one of the books I wrote called In an Unspoken Voice, um, I, I describe a scene, a scene where I'm walking across the street uh, not far from here, just two blocks from here. And a, a teenage driver, not seeing that it was a stop sign, hit me at about 25 miles an hour. And I was thrown into the windshield and then thrown up into the air, onto the tarmac, onto the road. And uh, I dissociated and in this case, it was like I was outside of my body, up above me, looking down and seeing myself sprawled on the, on the ground. And at that moment, or right after that, uh, a woman came by and she kneeled down, so she was at the same level as, as me. And she said, I'm a doctor, actually a pediatrician, well, I'm just thinking yeah, that's exactly the specialty I need right now. And she said, uh, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, please stay here with me. And she took my hand in her hand. And in that moment, I came down from being above my body into my body. And my body had these rhythms, these cycles of shaking and trembling that went on for it hard to know because I don't, you know, it's, you don't really, um, keep track of time, but for a while. And thankfully when I was taken to the hospital, miraculously, I did not have serious wounds, which in itself was miraculous. Um, but I was able to ground, to be in my body, to come back, to return to a large degree, of course, because I knew what to do and how to do it but I also needed that empathetic other who was there, who was there with me, who was there by my side. I mean, literally by my side. So it's both 
the shaking and the trembling, but also for that to be effective, you really need somebody there to be present with you. And that woman was that for, for me. 25% of the bones in your body are in your feet. Your feet are a part of your body, which we tend to take for granted. Yet they hold us up every day, assuming we're standing up. We've been wearing Vivo Barefoot Shoes for more than eight years now. They are incredible. They have a wide toe box and a minimal, sh- minimal sole. Research has shown that by wearing Vivo Barefoot Shoes, your foot strength will increase by 60% in a matter of months. And foot strength is really important to your balance and your overall movement potential. We've partnered with Vivo Barefoot Shoes because we absolutely adore them. They have transformed our own physiology and we really, really believe in them. That's all we wear. They're giving you 20% off their range of shoes. They have a full range of kids, adults, women's, men. Dress shoes, all sorts. Formal shoes, all sorts of full range anyway. 20% off with the code HAPPYPAIR20 at checkout. You'll also get free access to their online course, which is called Human Potential with so many world-leading experts incorporating breath work, animal movement, calisthenics, some things we absolutely adore. Simply use the code HAPPYPAIR20 for 20% off. Really amazing, full range of shoes. Just go to vivobarefoot.com. So, so I, I was kind of thinking there that there's there's loads of different ways to have got trauma. You know, it can be from early childhood. It can be from accidents. It can be from, um, it, it typically relationships. It can be from, uh, there's a million different ways that I, that I understand that one can experience trauma. And I'm just wondering, like we're 44 year old men that grew up in Ireland and I'm sure we've had lots of different traumas and some of them are quite obvious. Like, you know, I got separated and divorced and that was quite a, a very emotional experience. And I'm kind of wondering, like, how do we identify traumas of what is a trauma and unraveling it? Because, you know, some of them are very obvious, but certainly the early childhood ones, I'm not exactly sure how I'd unravel this or determine if I had them or not. Yeah. I'm sure everyone listening is thinking the same thing. Maybe not everyone. But. Yeah, well, those are pre-verbal, not only are not only pre-verbal, but often are non-verbal. These are things before we had words uh, to understand what was going on. And for example, uh, children were sometimes uh, left with somebody else and the parents needed to go somewhere or to be... Uh, uh, because maybe one of them had an illness. And uh, and so to the child, they just feel the abandonment. And the abandonment, because if, if we don't have a caretaker, we, in reality, will not be able to survive. We need someone there to take care of us. And so again, those are things that just gives a, a gut-wrenching panic. And that it's there as a bodily response, a physiological response, and it's not there as a memory, at least not as a conscious memory. It's there probably as a, not even as an emotional memory, but as a procedural memory, sometimes called the body memory. So that panic is there. And then when we're in a relationship and there's a divorce or we're uh, uh, we're left by somebody that say the relationship is over, well, we just, our body flashes back to that early procedural memory, that early body memory, and we feel completely overwhelmed, even though it was just the ending of a relationship with somebody who had a good, solid, early uh, 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 re- relationship. Uh, it wouldn't have, I mean, it would be difficult. You know, we would maybe find some friends and talk to them about, you know, about our sadness. And but it's not going to be overwhelming. But when we don't have that foundation, that strong foundation, then it becomes overwhelming, and we go into a panic, and it feels like we're going to die, because again, as infants, if we're left alone, we could die. So, um, so it really, really predisposes what has happened to us before that and way, way, way before that. So is it, so like, as Dave was kind of wondering there, is kind of one of the prime indicators that one does have trauma in one's life is that you've strong feelings of overwhelm that you can't deal with and borderline panic. Is that kind of an indicator around certain things? If there's a common scenario that you're finding yourself in and there's a feeling of panic and dread and overwhelming about it, is that an indication that there could be trauma relating to this? Yes, it's a very good indication. Okay. And again, remember, it's real overwhelm. It's not just we feel crappy. 
but it's like it shakes us to our very foundation. And that's one of the differences between trauma and difficult events, difficult emotional events, because they're not in all the same, although they can contribute to each other. Wow. So it's, so it's that distinction that it's like, it's, it's a deep, like vulnerable kind of panic or overwhelm. It's not just normal overwhelm. That's right. It really, as I said, it just shakes us to our very foundation. It, it's, it, it, it's like agony. Wow. And agony is different than the stress. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I've got a question because a lot of people who listen to our show are parents. And I wear parents and I have a four month old as well and a 10 year old and a 13 year old. And I'm just wondering, like, as a parent, how can we do our best to untraumatize or not traumatize our children? Or minimize the trauma, minimize that, the that, trauma gonna... that happens to our children. And that's a very big question, but even some broad brush ideas there. Sure. Actually, that's another one of my books called A Parent's uh, Trauma Proofing Your Kids, A Parent's Guide for Insulin Confidence, Joy and Resilience. And there are things that we can do to just be with the child. For example, children will fall off their bicycles. They will wind up in the emergency room going through a, a plate glass window or something horrible like that or swallowing something and they wind up in the emergency room. If there's somebody there that's with them, that's really like that woman was holding my hand and connecting with them, that can make all the difference in the world. So they're not just taken and are alone in the emergency room, but there is someone there with them. And that makes, that often makes all the difference, all the difference in the world. So we, we, uh, we we can't take what happened away, but we can know that they're supported. And you usually, when you sit by the child, they will start to take easy easy breaths and start gently t- trembling. Often they'll cry, and to just say yes, it's okay. It's just good to cry. Just let the hurt come out of you. So having that parent or guardian with them makes all the difference in the world. You know, we've also, uh, and at different times, done trainings for, for uh, people who work in emergency rooms, uh, nurses and physicians, and what they can do when a child comes in to help calm the child down. So again, they don't have to carry with them that overwhelming helplessness, which then becomes like the gut grit, gripping, uh, gut gripping trauma. Wow, it's, it's, so it's, there are things we can do and we can do them. And the more tools that we learn, the more resilient our children will be, the more confident and, and joyful and resilient our kids will be. So in a way, every time something happens like that, it's also an opportunity for the, for the children to become even more resilient. I, I had a, a, a young child, a godchild, and he had an accident and I was with him. And then I heard from his mother that one of the children in his class had had fallen. I think he got hit by a ball or something like that. And he was crying. And my godson went up and just stayed by the kid and said, it's okay, it's, it's okay, it's good to cry, it's good to cry. So it, it, he then became the transporter of that vital emotional information to help another child rebound from their, what could have been a trauma, but then didn't have to become a trauma. Amazing. It seems like it's one of the keys is presence to to minimizing the trauma that a child typically can can be, be subject to. And given nowadays we live in a world that's highly distracted and that many yeah. parents are, and me myself, when I'm stressed out, my kids are wrecking my head, I'll go to the digital babysitter, put something onto them and there they go, Grant, just out of my head. You know, and I have a few minutes to sit and regulate myself. But what's the impact of this? Is the, is the presence 
needed only when they're at a time of stress or is the present needed always? Because it seems like trauma is when they're in a really difficult circumstance yeah. or, and there's no one there to help regulate them and bring them back and support them That's and right. remind them that everything's okay. So is it mostly that in parenting, if you want to minimize the trauma in your child, it's presence when they're enduring a really difficult situation? Yeah, the key, the key word, the operative here is present or presence. Yeah. yeah. So how do we get, how do we first get, you know, very often the child will have an accident and the parent will yell at them something like, I told you not to do that. <laughs> What's really happening is the parent is, is scared. And so what the parent needs to do or the caregiver needs to do first is um, become present within themselves so that they're not, because children will mirror what the emotion of the parents. So if the parents are fearful, the child will feel even more fear. So the first thing we need to do is uh, contact our fear and not get stuck with our fear. And there's a, a way that, uh, that this really works, and that is by understanding what fear is. So fear is made up basically of three components, a body sensation and thoughts and images that might come up. So for example, um, uh, fear is often a, a twisting in the gut or a, a rapid heartbeat. And thoughts might be associated with that, like, I don't know what to do. And then it could be an image of something that happened many, many years ago. So, uh, so if we then contact our sensations and notice also our thoughts and our, our images, then we can move through and then we're okay. You know, uh, every time, you, not every time, I guess, but when you're flying an airplane, often the, the, uh, the stewards say something like, you know, in the unlikely event of a depressurization, of course, the word we hear at depressurization, uh, uh, oxygen masks will come down. If you're with an older person or a child, put the mask on you first and then take the mask and put it on the child. So we really need to attend to ourselves first so that we can become fully present wow. with our child. That's makes good. a lot of sense because when we were raised, it was kind of like when you fell, it was a bit more like, oh, you're grand, get up, come on. Oh, look, there's a tree over there, distraction. So as a result, yeah. when my children, when they were younger, would fall, I'd be like, come on, you're grand, here, let's, let's go off. And it was here, distraction. Look, a sweet. Do you want a sweet? And it took me years to understand that all I had to do was hold them and tell them it's, you know, it's all all right. And, and they would go through the crying and then they would feel fine. And it, it took me a long time and I'm still working my way through that one. Yeah, not so. Yeah, I mean, of course, that depends a lot on how we were raised. Yeah. We were told, you know, oh, just get over it or something like that. And that's likely how we'll respond. You know, I'm just thinking it's really, really wonderful. I'm talking with the two of you, the pair of you. Oh. And that this, you're um, both men. And often we don't think that men are interested in these kind of things and becoming more emotionally available for their kids. So I think it's just great that both of you are and that you are arranging to have this pair cost. <laughs> <laughs> Good Love one. That. Good one. You got pair twice in that sentence. That Fair. was very impressive. Well done, Peter. 10 out of 10. Um, I wonder, <laughs> behind, you, behind you there's a drum skin is that like, it's like, see, see there to your left, there's a drum skin. And I wonder, does that have any connotation to like ceremonies or communal oh. ways to, to heal trauma? Is that any relation to trauma and the tribal exactly. ceremonies of healing one of the via dance yes. or connection and relationships and all of yeah, that good yeah, stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I had the privilege. I lived in Arizona for some years and I worked also, and I, I did some training at the Hopi Guidance Center in Kirkosmibi, Arizona. And uh, and also I knew some of the uh, Navajo people. And they have ceremonies, for example, when a, when a soldier comes back from war to, to uh, n neutralize the trauma that they're bringing back so that they don't bring it back to their families and their, and their communities. Uh, you know, um, 
in, in my autobiography, one of the chapters is about, um, let's see, what was the title? Um, uh, many cultures, one race, the human race. And I have learned so much from indigenous cultures of how they heal in, in community. That was one of the things that I, I learned is that, again, it, we tend to see trauma as something that happens to us individually you know, as individuals that we have therapy as individuals. But really healing really needs also to happen in community. Um, you know, I, I had the opportunity that's also in that same chapter uh, of visiting the Kranaki people. It's a tribe in re remote areas in, in Brazil. And um, I wanted to know what how they maybe deal with with the Portuguese word is sustas, which means uh, more something like uh, fear paralysis. And so uh, after like traveling for 25 hours, we eventually wound there and I was completely sweating. It was like 100 degrees. And I, I came to the encampment and I met with the chief and uh, I asked him if he was familiar with shustus, the, the fright paralysis. And he said yes, but also his daughter, the princess, uh, also knew about trauma. And so she told him about trauma and so forth. And he said, but you make a mistake that trauma just isn't about what happens to us, but it, when there's a breach in the community, and that's where the susceptibility is. And uh, he, and they uh, they told there was a story of this woman, and she was um, she was pregnant, and she was a high risk pregnancy because she was diabetic, and she had she had twins, and so they took her to the hospital about six seven hours away, and uh, and both of the uh, the infants were, were stillborn, they weren't alive. And she went into a profound depression, a profound depression, and they wanted to give her shock treatment. So the members from the tribe went there in the middle of the night, they fashioned a ladder to her window and came and brought her down and brought her back to the tribe. And she was just uh, complete depressed and shut down. They, but they didn't try to do any therapy with her. They just let her be there when they would do their uh, their rituals, their dance. It's a, I wouldn't even call it a dance, but it's a movement. It's, uh, they showed us this, and it really was uh, very simple movement steps, but made a real altered in our state of consciousness. It was really quite striking. So, but she was outside of the circle and she was just there, not moving, not talking. And, but they didn't try to get her to come or anything like that. They just let her be there. And then one day after some time, she just started sobbing. No, I think some of the, 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 the people in the tribe started crying and then she started sobbing. And then she came in and, uh, became part of the circle and then she was healed. So it was just, it wasn't like doing psychotherapy or it's trauma therapy with her, but really bringing together the power and the coherence of the group. And so again, that was one of the things that really uh, made it clear to me that trauma just isn't an individual thing, but it's something that happens in the, when the fabric of the culture is is compromised amazing i wow. remember reading a book about a rural african tribe who the the author's grandfather died and as a community they came together and wailed and they wailed mm -hmm. for hours and it was like yeah. this tribal thing and it went on and there were screams and it's just so different to how 
we grieve in modern day society. It's often in yeah. isolation and often people are afraid to talk about it. Go out, like, how and, are you feeling? And the processing, yeah. the processing in both those instances, there's a very physiological expression rather than a psychological yeah. expression, which maybe in, in terms of common unity in community, um, yeah. th- these things can dissipate in a different way that might not be verbalizing it or sitting there in a heady kind of talking fashion. Yeah, I mean, in general, as a society, we don't do well with grief. It's something we want to kind of push away and keep under the covers. Uh, I think it's maybe we're afraid that if we feel the grief, that we'll be just paralyzed and, and just overwhelmed by it. But really, uh, by by discounting grief, we really discount love and joy. And But again, grief is something that is not just held by a person, but is held by a group and is held together by that group. And so to to be with grief as an individual is so different than being with grief with others who are also sharing their grief, as you mentioned. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that we really have to learn, we really can learn from so-called more pr- primitive cultures, but 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 not really primitive in some way, much more emotionally advanced than we are. And uh, the idea of sharing together and being in community. And there was an anthropologist, gosh, I cannot remember his name right now. He was in the subjectivist school and he went and he, instead of just studying with pencil and paper, uh, what, um, What's as uh, what tribes were doing, he would become a member of the tribe and really participate in their rituals and really learn how important it was that they shared their grief together and that they danced their and grief together. And after they expunged their grief, then they went off together in the forest and danced in the forest. In other words, dance with joy. So it went from grief to joy. So I think we we have just so much to learn and we are so <laughs> our worst best I'm our worst students at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um I on, on the topic of the kind of tribal tribal aspect and the commune and commune kind of aspect, like there's a couple of aspects because I know um my understanding is that like trauma is a buildup of energy which is trapped inside of ourselves um in our autonomic nervous system and I've certainly seen when I've I've done holotropic breathing a couple of times and I've seen people have these incredible you know breakthroughs or breakdowns where they just erupt in tears and this gr- massive expression comes out of them and I wonder on that that kind of exact thing of um you know stuck energy and childhood it almost seems like each one of us whether we are children or adults we have this inner child and trauma is almost where this inner child is is really scared and this deep kind of hurt going on. Yeah. And it's kind of really holding this inner child within ourselves at whatever stage of life we are. Yeah. Yeah, we become too scared to cry. The sounds won't come, the voice won't come. Actually, Lenore Tour wrote a wonderful book called Too Scared to Cry. How we just catch our breath. I mean, you think about it. If you're driving in your car and somebody comes right at you and almost hits you. Do you take a full out breath? No, you take a gasping in breath and that breath can get stuck. So you were talking about um, uh, polytropic breathing. Uh, uh, When I work with breath, I work with it in a a different way, uh, in a more, more gentle way, but really it's to allow that, uh, that, um, stuck energy, that full out breath to occur so that energy then can start flowing. So trauma is about fixity. Healing trauma is about flow, about coming back to connection and flow. Be- you, you articulate it so beautifully, like it's so applicable in terms of like, you know, obviously there's so much nuances and so much detail in it, but as a broad brush statement, it seems like it really is about community together, being held, being referenced, presence, all these type of things are broad brush ways in which we can deal with our own traumas. Yeah. Again, just really emphasizing the importance of community. 
and feeling connected and supported in community. I think that's really, really essential. And in a way, as a sine qua non to healing, is that that we we feel that we are held, we are supported by that present other. So it seems like one of the most important things to overcoming trauma is the presence. It's presence and acceptance ultimately. In relation to other people, in relation yeah. to another, like that, having that feeling of it. And it seems like modern culture is almost like the antithesis of it because there's, you know, yeah. we're always looking outside of ourselves for things. Whereas ultimately, when you describe that Peruvian village where people were, you know, maybe it sounds like it's a mythical place, but where people were content and probably quite, you know, it was a slower pace of life and family was prioritized and there was, rela- you know, simple relationships. It wasn't necessarily about getting the latest Tesla or the latest iPhone and going on holidays to somewhere right. fancy. Yeah, I mean, it's sad when I see how kids become disconnected from themselves, uh, disconnected from each other because they're they're on their devices. You know, I mean, uh, I go into a restaurant or go to a, uh, maybe even a sports event and you see the kids are there. They're not with each other. They're with their devices. And so we lose that social connection that, um, and, and without that, we're really lost. And I fear that this will be maybe known as the lost generation because we're not able to be with each other. I mean, this isn't true, of course, in everybody, but it's sadly quite prevalent in our, in our technological society. I mean, technology is great. You know, I mean, it's pretty amazing that we're able to talk to each other literally thousands of miles apart. It's quite astonishing, really. But it's the connection that's really important. It's being there with the pair of you that makes the difference in me feeling connected and me feeling connected with you. And I think you feeling connected also with me. So again, it's about connection. It's about opening to grief. It's about allowing that full out breath to occur. These are all things that that are that are necessary for healing. Wow, it sounds like we're getting the the very distilled kind of you know like, and I appreciate it so much that we're getting a very distilled message of here of very general applicable things which are going to benefit people's life in relation to their life in general and obviously with helping to overcome trauma because trauma seems like it's just part of life you know it's yeah. there will be there will be ups and downs of life and the more that we have healthy relationships but trauma seems to be it typically occurs in the absence of presence and that we really? don't necessarily have to have a huge amount of trauma if we have a community around there that can be present with us at times of distress. But but yeah, but the trauma will happen, but then there's community around you to support you that it, this energy can be mitigated Dissipate. in the moment. Did we do all right there, Peter? How did we do there? I, I couldn't really add anything more. I mean, again, it's about the benefit of connection. You know, there's a, Mo, a Motown song that goes, it takes one to stand in the dark alone. It takes two to let the light shine through. And I would say, and it takes many others to really support our healing and reconnecting with ourselves. So, um, yeah. I mean, it seems like this is the theme that we keep coming back to. And, and, and the reason is because it's so vitally important, you know, and it's really, um, Hopefully what our families can occur can be there to support us. Wow. And is this even the same with when I think of generational trauma, like I think of my parents and parents' parents and I look at kind of like sometimes I, although I don't want to, like my mother's voice comes out of my mouth when I'm talking to my kids or my father's voice does and it's just this, I'm kind of passing down the way that they parent me to my children and I'm doing my best to catch myself in the moment. But I guess this generational thing kind of happens and we, yeah. I, I guess it's probably yeah. presence again, is it? Well, it's and not awareness. just the parents. 
but it's the parents' parents and the parents' 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 parents. In other words, the whole line of our ancestry that really has an effect on us. And and a traumatic can have a traumatic effect, but it's not just about about trauma. Uh, sometimes great amounts of wisdom and support can occur. Um, hey, it's getting a little bit. I'm, I'm just say a little bit. Uh, when I was started working with more people in the late sixties and early seventies, some. Uh, would have the smell of burning flesh. And it didn't make sense to me because many of them, most of them, uh, were, were vegetarians. So where was that coming from? Well, as I pursued that and asked them to talk to their parents and grandparents, it turns out that that either parents or grandparents were in the Holocaust. And so they actually might have smelt that. At first I thought, that's not possible. How could that possibly be? But then I came across this research a few years ago uh, where um, uh, uh, an, a mouse was exposed to the scent of cherry blossom, which for us is a pleasant uh, scent, but at least it certainly wasn't uh, aversive to them. But then what they would do is, is they would expose them to the scent, but then they would follow that by an electric shock, and the animals would shake and tremble and defecate in a in in, in a paralytic way, not in the healing way. And um, and so uh, so it turns out that uh, that not only did the the mice uh, uh, defecate and tear it. But their, uh, but their parent, that their children and grandchildren and great 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 children would also do that, and even in many cases more than the parents themselves. That, that so was that was that was when they that was when they smelled the cherry blossom. They immediately that's the right. same response. They, when they smelled the cherry blossom, they would shake and tremble and defecate in terror. Wow! Just, and that was after five generations, so it was passed on. But again, it's not just the trauma. Because I, I'm thinking about this one woman. There was an airplane that was flying from Denver to Chicago, a DC-10, and midway in the flight, the rear engine exploded, and it cut off the um, the hydraulic lines. And the uh, and and so the plane was unable to steer, and so the pilot and a co-pilot tried to steer it by just. Uh, easing up and accelerating on one engine and the other, and they were able to land uh, in a uh, in a, 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 a regional airport in, in Sioux City. And when the plane it broke up into pieces, and there were great fireballs occurring. And so I'm working with this woman named Katie who was on that flight. And in in somatic experience, we just don't go right to the trauma. In my autobiography, I talk about a time when I felt really deeply held and cherished and loved because that was so important and allowed me then to explore these devastating things that, that happened. So anyhow, uh, we start with her uh, in, the, in the cornfields with the sun on her back and the warm sun on her back. And it was important for her to experience that first before going into the drama itself. Then we return to the plane, and she's upside down, and she, they, she, uh, in the in the body memory, she opens the seat belt, and then lets herself down, and it's completely black, and there's smoke, and there are just twisted wires everywhere, and she didn't know what to do, and she heard the voice a voice saying to her, Katie, Katie, go, crawl, go to the light, go to the light. And she saw this speck of light and she crawled there and that's how she escaped. Oh, so why am I telling this story? Well, it turns out that both her father and grandfather were in airline crashes. One was a, a military crash, the other was a commercial crash. And they both escaped by crawling to the light. So somehow that information and that moment of life thread came barreling through and 
made it possible for her to escape. So it's not just trauma, but it's something much greater than trauma, much greater in, 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 uh, and, and potentially life-saving. Wow. It, it, that's so beautiful. Like it really kind of validates us the importance of that we are not alone. Like we are the product of everyone that's come before us. And yes, and everyone that will come after us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Our children are a manifestation of ourselves as well. Yeah, that's right. Peter, you are that, that, like I you're a beautiful, wise being to get to spend time with. What a privilege. I feel blessed. I really, really do. Well, great. All right. Well, thanks. Being thanks with for the you, universal Bill. messages. Can you, can, you te- can you tell us about your autobiography so people can oh. pre-order it right now? And oh, it's sure. Just they out. can do that right now. It's actually helpful because that it helps link things. So if you think you might want it, I you'll be doing me a favor by pre-ordering it. The title is An Autobiography of Trauma, A Healing Journey. And it really is about my healing. And I wrote it only when I was sure that it could help other people with their own healing and writing their own stories. So you can just go to Amazon or whatever and then just go to An Autobiography, an autobiography of Trauma, The Healing Journey by Peter A. Levine. That's me. <laughs> Wonderful. Will it be on Kindle as well? I tend to listen to my books. Uh, I, it will be on Kindle as well. Yes, it will be on Kindle as will well. Will you read it yourself? You do have a lovely voice. I, oh, well, I... No, I, I definitely read it myself. I mean, I wrote it myself. It was very difficult. Uh, you know, I first wrote it just as an excavation of my own life because now I'm in my 80s. You know, I wanted to really say it was time to really review my life and, and to look at the arc and to form a coherent narrative of my, of my life. And so I was planning not to, to make this as a book. And I was conflicted. I was very conflicted. So dreams often come to me and they often come in a way that really is significant. So I had the following dream. And in the dream, I'm facing into this field. And in my hands, I have a whole ream of paper on each hand that, that's typewritten. And I'm looking from one to the other, and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. Then a wind comes from behind me and takes all of these pages and blows them out into the meadow. And then I realized that the reason that I'm doing this is because it's something that everybody can use. And let it land where it may. So that was my dream, and that was my decision to um, to make the dream uh, to make the dream to um, to to let this work come out for everyone's healing, for yeah, for all of our healing. And again, I think again, it's this idea of community. I'm, it's not just for me, but it's for all of us. And I think that is the theme that just keeps coming back again. And again, well, it's it's come back round, and I'm thank you so much, um, and I look forward to reading your book or listening to it. I tend to listen to books, so I really look forward to listening to it. Yeah. And and we're so grateful for your time and your wisdom. It's been an absolute treat. Really, really has. Well, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate being with you guys. Yeah, yeah we yeah, loved it. Yeah, really, really loved it. But well, really. w- wishing you all the very best, Peter, and and really thanks so much again for your time. We're unbelievable. Oh grateful. yeah, you're welcome, and thank you for your interest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're, it was beautiful. It was honestly yeah, right. divine. Super okay. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Thanks, yourself. Peter. All the best. All the best. Bye-bye. 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 Yeah. Good now. While we have you, once a week we write a newsletter. It's called Happier. It's got simple, tried and tested practices to make your life better. We include recipes and practices that you can apply on a daily basis to make your life happier. We've had lots of people say before that it's really helped make their life better. So you can sign up on the happypairs.ie, our weekly newsletter called Happier.